Thank you. Very well said. Developed scenarios concerning the long term depletion of natural resources. And it's on this second subject that uh, Palacios will actually present in a moment. 20 years ago, sustainability was not a meaningful concept for business. Now it's the dominant paradigm involving long-term thinking and scenario planning. And I'd just like to leave you with a, uh, a other uh, delittles management, world famous management consultancy, wrote a report a couple of years back ensuring survival business models in low carbon worlds they had four four conclusions or they made four assertions one the political momentum towards a low carbon future is unstoppable two the carbon is a real cost of business three that investors increasingly understand the significance of a low carbon future and behave accordingly and four that the time to act is now what I will present now is effectively a, a framework that we are using in order to suggest uh, the development of a new industry and that's some of the ideas that we are currently implementing in collaboration with the consultancy company called Stratificator in Indonesia. So currently we are writing a policy brief for the Indonesian <coughs> government using the support uh, of the foreign office, of the British foreign office. So the idea is uh, profit, planet and people, a new framework to develop new industries that will benefit the UK, <coughs> but also some of the emerging economies. I don't think I'll next please. No. No, <coughs> yeah. Okay, so what is the problem? One of the problems we face today is that there's a lot of pressure for energy services and also for food. Why? Because we will see a dramatic increase uh, in the GDP of many of the emerging economies. And one of the, uh, gra this graphic highlights what's going to happen with the UK, but the interesting thing is you see massive increase in China, massive increase in India, and massive increase in Indonesia, and also some of the economies come, coming out of the bottom, which is Vietnam. So one of the fastest growing economies over the next 40 years is likely to be Vietnam, India, Nigeria, China, and Indonesia. And that's going to put a lot of pressure <coughs> on providing energy services and food for these countries. So the second pressure, <coughs> in addition to the uh, economic growth, is population growth. This has shown you too much of what was the population <coughs> in the 1950s and what's likely to be the population in the next 40 years. So the size of the country has been scaled in order to demonstrate in a visual way what is going to happen around the world. So you see the massive expansion in India, but you also see a massive expansion in terms of population in Africa. And somehow we need to provide energy services in Africa and also in, in Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, and also new energy services. So these two problems now combine together because not only people will become richer, but also we will have a large number of people that we will have to treat with food and energy services. And all of these things is likely to put more pressure on the environment. And we can see there the different gas emissions that's coming from the different uh, activities that we perform. One of the biggest emitters is effectively energy. So if we want to do anything about uh, the CO2 emissions, we need to address the problem of energy. And that's one of the proposals that we are putting forward. So you can see that the first uh, three colors is actually the emissions that is coming out of energy, and one of the bottom ones is that's coming out of agriculture. So it is very important that we take the pressure on energy <coughs> services very seriously if we really want to address the problem of climate change. Now, I just mentioned the word climate change. The assumption so far is that because we emit more and more CO2 emissions, this is going to lead in the, in the rise in the uh, temperature, the average temperature around the world. Now, as we already know, the last 10 years, there has been a reversal in this trend. So it is not exactly 100% clear if increasing the CO2 emissions results in a, in, a, in a problem with the climate change. However, what I will argue is that irrespective of what's going to happen with the climate change, we really need to move into a low carbon economy in order to move, in order to be able to provide the energy services that is needed. So moving to a low carbon economy, it is not just a question of addressing climate change. It is about providing the necessary services in order to fuel our socioeconomic activity in the next 40 years. So what we have to do is basically we need to have a close interaction between government and corporations. 
The job of the government is to provide the policy constraints. We deal with these constraints that the operators, the companies, they have to operate, and these constraints actually act as the legal constraints for the companies. Company's goal is to increase the profit, and by doing that, the hope is that they will increase the social welfare, which is the policy objective. And I don't think there is a problem with this cycle, as long as the policy constraints are properly designed. So if we design properly uh, the legal constraints, which is defined by the, pro by the policy co constraints, then we can achieve a cycle where the business will address profit, and at the same time, they will put back part of that profit into the society. So how do we do that? My view is that both business executives, but also policy makers, they need to think as if they are uh, portfolio managers. And what this means is that they will have to select a set of solutions that will address the issue of uh, energy services, and they will have to address at what intensity these different solutions they will have to be uh, put in place. So the example you see there is A, B, and C. In some cases, you need to have a, you need to have a pre liberalization which means that the government will have a key role in providing energy services. In other cases, you need to have a free open market. So it's not a solution in my view, it's not just about the companies providing all the services, but it might be a mixture of governments and, uh, and private enterprises that they try to address the problem, the problem of energy services and food production. So the classic example is, how we try to do that is we use a framework, particularly in the energy sector, of affordability, security, and sustainability. And whatever policy action is put in place, it has to address one or the other. So in other words, there is a trade-off. Either you will address security, and you will compromise sustainability, or you will address sustainability, and you might have to compromise on affordability. And that's exactly what's happening right now in the UK with the wind industry, where it's becoming simply too expensive. <coughs> I think that framework is wrong, and it needs revision. I think we need to think about people, profit, and planet. And what I mean by that is we need to come up with a strategy where it's going to be people, it's good for the people, particularly the local communities. It has to be good for the profit. Otherwise, why businesses and investors will, will have to invest their money? But at the same time, it has to be good for the planet. One proposal is the one that was put forward by Greg, which addresses these two things without any compromises. There are obviously other, other solutions as well. If we do a policy, that puts too much emphasis on the planet, it is likely to fail. Because it will not take into account the needs of the local people. So if you put whatever proposal you put forward, it needs to take into account uh, the benefit that the people, particularly the local community, will get out of that. Otherwise, the policy is not going to uh, be accepted. So how do we do that? One of the proposals we put forward in our center is to design scenarios. So we look scenarios about what might happen the next 40 years. So we're not interested in what will happen the next year or the next three years, but what, how the world will look like the next 40 years. And this is a world that we've developed over the last uh, <coughs> year. So we develop global scenarios. Where we look at the global trends in terms of uh, food, we can look in terms of energy, and then based on these global trends, we go and we look into what might happen in the United Kingdom, what will happen in Indonesia, what will happen in China. And then, using the scenarios about a specific country, we move into a more detailed level where we look at the economics of specific projects. But in order to look at the economics of specific projects, you really need to understand the global picture and you need to understand the country-specific picture in order to be able to properly assess the very last uh, uh, layer. <coughs> and in order to develop the global pictures, we need to look into the population growth, we need to look into the land cover, we need to look at technology, and we need to look into the energy mix. In other words, we need to look into the fundamental building blocks. And based on these general trends, we come up with a number of scenarios. In that example, you see four different scenarios. Now, none of these scenarios is going to be a reality. The point here is that the reality is going to be a mixture of these scenarios. But if we design today policies that are resilient enough for all of these scenarios, then we are ready uh, for the future. No matter what's going to happen, we will be ready because we can test the resilience of the strategies today among the four scenarios where the combination of this is going to be the reality in the future. 
This is an example of how we do that with gas. There's a lot of discussion about oil. And, then, and we can publish some reports that say that the world oil production, the cheap oil, not the expensive oil, is going to pick the next uh, 30 years, maximum. Obviously, there is plenty of oil on the ground, but it's expensive oil, and we might have problems extracting. So there is a problem not with the resource of oil, with the rate of extraction of oil. Then we look into natural gas. There's a lot of discussion whether the, the 21st century is going to be the gas era. And what we notice in this graphic is that it's actually not going to be the case. Given the current policies, if we continue with the, with the population growth and the <coughs> demand of the energy services, the next 30 years, we will be unable to fulfill all the demand that is required for, from natural gas. So although the natural gas is going to be after 2050, we will not be able to satisfy the full demand unless we do something at the <coughs> demand side early enough. And I think that's a very different picture from just discussing peak oil or peak gas. You need to look into the direction between supply and demand. The peak might happen later, but the rate of extraction might not be enough to provide us with the energy services that we need. And this is one of the scenarios that will be published shortly. The result is available, and if you are interested, you can email us and we will send you the report. So what do we do? Two alternative scenarios by addressing the supply side of the economy and at the same time if they address the demand side of the economy, or both of them. And you can see that there is a, a massive efficiency gain they can make, both in the commercial and industrial sectors, in both of the scenarios. So I'm going to just finish my presentation by repeating what I just said. I think that we need to look into the people profit and planet <coughs> framework and we need to make use of a new tool for policy making which is scenarios over the next 40 or 50 years and develop new industries <coughs> based upon these two policy tools. Thank you very much.